Okay, are you ready? Welcome. Nice that you offered your free Saturday afternoon to be with us to talk about such an important thing as reforming the United Nations, which is kind of an abstract body to me. Um, and I hope that at the end of this afternoon, we'll have some more concrete ideas about reforming. I'm very happy you are here in the, such a colorful audience of all ages and backgrounds. It's also due to May May Meyer, who has his large international uh, connections and invited everybody to join. We'll talk about that later. My name is Sandra Rottenberg. I'm an independent journalist and program maker. As we will talk English, or does everybody... Who does not understand any Dutch? Oh, a few. Okay. Okay, then we'll talk English. Otherwise, we would change into Dutch, which is easier for us. As you can hear, I'm not a native speaker. Just please help me out. Let's help each other out if we don't find the right logo or shirt in logo. No problem at all. Um, our, our this afternoon, uh, I hope you are invited to join ask questions, whatever. It's an interactive afternoon. We will end the, after the afternoon with uh, two workshops where we really exchange with e each other. Um, um, this uh, meeting is also live streamed. And a few countries will follow this. Which countries are, are we have to welcome now as well, May May? The United States of America, Mali, India, and maybe Israel, uh, Palestine, and all the other countries, uh, because we've sent out a link to many, many peace organizations and peace lovers. Well, so this is a small group of people in Amsterdam, and we're connected all over the world. But it makes it important that you talk into the microphone, otherwise people cannot hear you. And as you see, the whole session is filmed. There's also in the afternoon session, when we're with the workshops, they will ju uh, jump in and maybe ask you something, how, what you think about it, and if it's necessary or if it's just nonsense or whatever. Um, my first, what I want to know. Thinking about the United Nations, what's the first word what pops up? Just improvise. Peace. United. Right. United. United. Bureaucratic. Sustainable, Sustainable development goals. Human, Human rights. Diplomacy. Diplomacy. Powerless. Powerless. Grandship. Grandship. More? Lack of leadership. Lack of leadership. <laughs> what? <laughs> I didn't hear. Oh, yes, was supported. Meeting place. Meeting place. Responsibility. Responsibility. So, huh? Crisis. Crisis. Lack of accountability. So now we see that there are two sides. There is one, there's one, <laughs> one stream of consciousness. Yeah, one. Lack of gender equality. Lack of gen gender equality. This, this one side is like the, the words I hear are hopeful and are about cooperation and change, and the other are more critical. So how can we make them come together and change them in something new? Welcome. Um, but what do we know exactly from the United Nations? So I thought maybe we'd do a little quiz just to make us aware what we know and what we don't know. Maybe you will say that's too easy for us. But um, let's start... Uh, oh yeah, you can Twitter, it's very much appreciated. And these are the addresses. And this is question number one. There are no prizes today, which is... Uh, Pity, but maybe we'll find something about that later. Um, for example, a membership, a free membership in the board of the Dutch United Nations Committee. Um, okay, how many members does the UN have? And I have three proposals. Are these 249 countries? 193 countries? Or 413 countries? 
193. Who didn't know that? I didn't know that before. Okay, you're very much aware. In, okay, second question. Yeah, you, you, are, you, are, you are advanced. <laughs> um, which country is the youngest member? South Sudan. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> yeah, come in, come in. in uh, you you get the first question. In which year the UN Charters entered into force? Was it 1954, 1945, or 1948? In which year the UN Charters entered into force? When did the UN start? Oh, I think 1952 or something. 1952, okay. Come in, come in, come in, sit down. <laughs> 1952, who has another answer? 1945, that was the right answer. 1945, right after the Second World War. Okay. And then, where, what does the UN stand for? What are the most important issues? Who says, what are the most three important issues? Who says one? Peace and security. Human rights. Justice and respect for international law. Environment, yeah, but that was not, it's not so high and, and it's not the top three. Yeah, so it's a bit old fashioned. It makes us reflect already. That is social pro progress and freedom. So, the agenda has changed. Huh? In the our, our own agenda has changed. Then, what are the permanent members of the UN Security Council? Who can, who can s name them United, all? United States, China, Russia, France, the United Kingdom, and Italy. Nay. Not, Italy. Not Italy, but again. Who? France, yeah. China, United, United States, the Russian Federation, UK. and the UK. That are okay. UK. So, and then we also have that those are the permanent members of the Security Council, but there are also non-permanent members. How many? How many non-permanent members does the Security Council count? How many? Fifteen? Ten. Yeah. And, and, uh, and for how long are they elected? <laughs> <laughs> okay, for two years. So, and does anyone know about the Netherlands? What is the actual situation? Who knows? Who can explain? Uh, I come with you, to you with... They have a joint non-permanent membership of the Security Council and it's joint with Italy. Shares, Shares with Italy, is that right? <laughs> yeah? yeah? Do they share? Yeah? This, this, year, this year is Italy, next year is the Netherlands. Next, this year Italy, next year the Netherlands, is that right? And what about Sweden then? Um, yeah, no, sorry, but I, because I think it's Sweden, Sweden and the Netherlands. Are you sure? Yeah, okay, can someone look this up? Sietje, it's Italy? Okay, we don't want to share with Sweden. Okay. And who, who will be member? We, uh, first Italy and then the Netherlands. This year's Italy and then the Netherlands. Okay. So what can we, what can we expect when? Who can explain that? If the Netherlands are member of the Security Council, what can they do? What can we can? What can we do? Agenda setting. What more? What more? Is it important? Do you have power when you are in the Security Council? Do you have more power? Influence, yeah? yeah. What kind of influence? Simone Filippini? Well, I think the, uh, the thing is that if you are well prepared, so you see to it that you have great networks within, uh, with, uh, say, the permanent members of the uh, UN Security Council, if you have your 
uh, focus uh, very uh, well developed. If, if you have great papers to contribute, then you can exert influence. Uh, so it all depends on yourself. It, if you don't do anything, you have no influence. It's always the same discussion in the European Union, where the, is the Netherlands a small tablecloth or a large napkin? And we can be a small tablecloth depending on how smart we are in influencing uh, behavior. So um, it depends on how a country functions in that role. So agenda setting and, and, and putting pressure on, on the other end. So maybe we, we can design a new agenda for the net prepare our commission uh, for next year uh, with a new agenda to inspire you for later this afternoon. How many, uh, how, how, how does a country become a member? Who can explain that? How do you become a member? When are you accepted as a new country? Imagine we would, together, we decide that we are the new republic of Humanity House. And <laughs> we want to become a member of the United Nations as we are here. You have to be recognized as a country. By who? By other countries. By other countries. By the whole, as a, a whole constitution of the United Nations. By, by the United Nations. Yeah, by the United Nations. Okay. Yep. But all the members. Uh, I think so. And then you also have to pay your dues. Okay. And is there is there a role for the Security Council? No. UN General Assembly. It's a two-third uh, majority vote is necessary in the assembly for admission of a new state. Okay. So we have to lobby a lot, I suppose, within uh, all these other 193 countries <laughs> who are member, if we want to establish our new Republic of Humanity House today. Um, then uh, the top three countries for humanitarian assistance, who can... Sweden, Norway, <laughs> Denmark, yeah, <laughs> Finland, no, no, <laughs> welcome, hi, I mean, um, uh, who knows, Syria? Syria? Receiving aid, receiving aid, oh, you thought who are paying the most, first receiving, we do first, which countries are receiving the most aid? or assistance or whatever. Syria, and then it's all in another country with an S, Somalia, and to my astonishment, Pakistan. Yeah, and who can explain to me what kind of assistance does Pakistan receive? What? I don't know, maybe like loans and kind of financial stuff? I'm not sure. For the refugees of Afghanistan, oh yeah, of course, yeah, of course, and also because maybe also because of the of the uh, earth, oh no, yeah, the the overstromingen, uh, flooding, and so is that also something where the UN is occupied with? Yeah, okay. There is a lot we don't know, eh? we're not sure about. Yeah, so it's good that we we control this because otherwise. Very reassured we know everything about UN, but we don't, we, in fact, we do not know so much about it, even people who are really committed with it. So, top uh, and bottom rankings, UNDP Human Development Index. Uh, what are the most prosperous countries? Norway, good. Luxembourg. You know, you know, no, no, no. <laughs> to, to stay in Europe, Switzerland, Switzerland, yeah, no, not, and then Australia, I say, Australia, yeah, I didn't know that, I really, Australia, I, I, I couldn't imagine that, so we're short, huh? huh? Because the UN Development Index is not just about being prosperous, it's about uh, being an inclusive uh, country, democratic, a good health care, uh, the life expectancy. Uh, so it's a kind of conglomerate of factors that make you into a country where basically everybody would like to live. 
And if you look at the, the index, you see countries like the Netherlands and the Nordics and Australia, New Zealand, etc., always in the top 10. Uh, and um, it's interesting, I looked up whether gender inequality, yeah. you mentioned yeah. gender inequality just now, makes a difference, yeah. but the same yeah. countries stay on top. Yeah. So it's, it's also about inclusiveness. The yeah. Netherlands is yeah. number seven at so the moment. In gender equality. No, in the uh, index, in it, uh, uh, and also when you include gender inequality, it's at the seventh uh, place on the ranking. Okay. I didn't know that. I thought we were very low in gender equality because we still have so such a lack of, for example, women professors at universities, less than in Pakistan. Yes. Yeah, m women members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even in the parliament, we have we have not that many women members. In other countries, we can. Where are other countries we can make? Uh, we can take as an example to us. So, and how many peacekeeping operations are taking place? Oh, sorry, on the bottom, sorry. I Chad, Niger, Central African Republic. Yeah. Did you know that? Do you have other countries in mind? South Sudan. South Sudan. Congo. Somalia. Afghanistan. Turkey. Yeah. There's always war there, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll come to talk about it probably later. Um, how many peacekeeping operations are led by the Department of Peacekeeping Operations? How many nowadays? Are it more than 10? Yes. Are it more than 20? No. So how much? 60. 60. 60. 60. Who can name them all? 16? No? <laughs> and uh, are there peacekeeping operations in Europe? Yes. And how and where? Kosovo? Cyprus. Yeah. And Cyprus. Ridiculous, huh? Cyprus. Yeah. For such a long time already. Since when do you know? Since when? Who knows? Since when? In Cyprus? 70 74, I think so, yeah. Brussel? <laughs> <laughs> Brussel is also will be occupied by the United Nations. Yeah, a very good idea. So, yeah. now, our knowledge is now fresh. And okay. Fantastic. I um, like to introduce you, Meme Meyer. Can you step forward and I give you a microphone? This is easy. You may sit if you like or stand. And Simone Filippini. Because it's, it's the fault of May May Meyer that we are here today. <laughs> and May May, she, she started an NGO. It's called uh, Peace SOS. And uh, Simone is, uh, she f until recently, she was director of a one of the largest Dutch NGOs. Uh, coordinate and um, she uh, she left and but now she has a l she has a lot of time and uh, because she has so so uh, a lack of work now uh, <laughs> she she is president of the Dutch how would you call that in the English I could they have taken the your own and what and, and what do you do as a United Nations and I come with Mele <coughs> Thank you. 
society and our own prosperity, but also to help others to prosper, we, we really need to become super active as citizens. And discussions as, as this one of today, which is part of the challenge, we will see little video yeah. just now, uh, is, is one of the stimulating uh, yeah. uh, events uh, to, to do this. Yeah, because, that, yeah, because we will find out in, in a minute, we are participating today in the new SHAPE Award of Global Challenges. And there is someone uh, from uh, Sweden who started this initiative in order to make us more aware and reflect on how can we reform the United Nations. Are we happy with it or not? What can be done better? And like a bottom-up questionnaire, and we will participate in that. And I hope that at the end of the day we will have three or six proposals seriously to be debated and that we can take to another meeting someday. Maybe you also have a very spe uh, personal uh, um, inspiration to, to, to organize this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where, I, where does this come from? You have an amazing international network yourself. Yeah, it comes from uh, 2014 when I saw a photo of uh, a wounded man holding his wounded son on his lap and I thought you know, this is something that we as humans do and we shouldn't accept it. You know, we can change the world and I'm going to go for it. And as long as it's, I can only change a little bit. But there are so many people involved like uh, Simona, the, the Dutch United uh, Association, um, the Association, Dutch United Nations, yeah. Association for the United Nations. There are so many more people involved. We've got people from the United States watching. I saw amazing initiatives in Israel. I saw people from Palestine standing up for peace. Those are the normal people, the normal people in the streets, and they are reaching out for peace. They are reaching out to each other. We don't, we don't want to fight. We want to raise our children. We want to have a world in which all children can play. That's what we want, and that's what I'm here for. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think an applause. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I totally yeah. stand by you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've Thank seen you, so Mary. much uh, yeah. suffering and, and yeah. such strong people under so difficult uh, circumstances. Totally yeah. uh, with you there. Yeah. 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 Um, what is, uh, I found that striking. Uh, as we were uh, discussing already what are themes of the United Nations, that we found out that one of the most important uh, points, uh, uh, subjects on the agenda, is not officially in the agenda. And one of the, the outcomes of the or the uh, expected stimulation about raising more awareness is about uh, climate change, for example. Uh, also, large-scale environmental degradation, violent conflict and extreme poverty. That are the main issues that are mentioned in this re reshaping the UN. Shall we watch the film? There's a little introduction of this new... The shape of a system will always determine the outcomes it achieves. The shape of our global governance system was decided after the Second World War, when the world was very different. Is it the right shape to tackle climate change and extreme poverty and global conflict? These challenges are global, not national. The way the world works together will dictate how we tackle them. It's time to explore new forms of global cooperation to future-proof our world. Humanity needs new minds, new voices, new ways, a new shape. Take part in the New Shape Prize. Help us reshape the future. We will do today. I forgot something very important to introduce where we are, where we are now. We are in Humanity House. I don't know who of you know knew already Humanity House. A lot of you. If you didn't come back another time, we have a, a wonderful experience in yeah what it means to be on the run in the world and find a new place. How difficult that is. Um, here in Humanity House. A lot of uh, discussions and meetings find place on all issues relating with human rights. Um, and um, this 
afternoon is organized due to Peace SOS, the Dutch United Nations Association, the World Solar Fund, and Humanity House, and sponsored by the Dutch United Nations Associations. Um, but then I forgot to ask, who are you? Who of you is active in an NGO? Okay, and who is uh, active in uh, who is active in in some form of UN body? Or okay, two of you. Who who is in politics? Yeah. <laughs> um, who's teacher? Oh, great. Um, who of you is a student? Great. Who of you is concerned in what way with climate change? And who of you with env uh, environmental issues? And who of you with violent conflicts? And who of you with poverty? Okay, you are very much aware of what's going on in the world. So this is the best audience we can have. Yeah, I think so. And who did I forget? Who says... I do something completely different. <laughs> yeah. Culture. 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 Okay. Business. Business. Decentralized government. Decentralized government. We'll come back on that. Yeah. Migration. Migration. Health. Health. Social, Social innovation. innovation. Women and peace security. Disarmament. Disarmament. Aviation. Okay, <laughs> very nice. So engaged as you are. Um, well, that was part one. Now part two. We will introduce two by two different guests that may may invite it to have some inspiration on what are do they doing and how hope they hope to reform any international cooperation. So thank you so far. Will you come back uh, later again? And then I want to invite Amine Ravier and Charles Dixon. You may sit there and we will talk about alternatives instead of, no problem, existing formats. You didn't shake hands. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, Amine. Uh, Ravier, he is, uh, yeah, how you call yourself? You are re re representing Bit Nation. Yeah. You may talk into that microphone. <laughs> and Bit Nation is an alternative, is a virtual alternative to the nation states. Can you, uh, oh, we have a short film. Shall oh, we look at that first? That is a nice introduction. <laughs> yeah. Eric Vollstedt has big plans. He's a business administration student and an ambassador, representing a state that exists only on the internet. BitNation wants to see international borders dissolved, together with governments. All basic needs are covered by private parties and organized along market economy lines. The hope is that one day BitNation will make traditional nation states redundant. The main idea is that everyone has a say and ideas. Everyone can introduce their own initiatives. Plus, every member of BitNation has the option to advertise their ideas. BitNation went online in late 2014 and currently has a population of 1,500. Anyone can become a citizen. And all the necessary papers are also provided. The Pangea platform allows residents to order passports and property deeds. You can even get married. Your digital marriage certificate is completely independent from any nation state. The idea as such is not a new one. People have been founding virtual states ever since the internet took off in the mid-1990s, from the Umaguma commune to the kingdom of Pottyland. Each state has its own culture and form of rule. For now it's more like a role-playing game, but one that Erik Vollstedt wants to see become reality. 
je nachdem, wo man geboren wird. You're forced to accept your geographical circumstances according to where you're born, and you can't decide for yourself which state services you would like to use without having to emigrate. With BitNation, the fact that we have competition in the future means we'll need a good reputation to survive. It's about customer satisfaction. In BitNation, residents can join forces to create different kinds of nations, each with its own laws. You can choose to live in a monarchy or a dictatorship. Blockchain serves as a kind of authority. All interactions between citizens are stored in an encrypted text file, and each individual is identified by a unique code. Blockchain also ensures that contracts are complied with. Payment comes in the shape of, you guessed it, virtual currencies such as bitcoins. Political scientist Gerald Fricke has been conducting research into these new web systems. This is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Is this a nice introduction? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Okay, sure. Is this working? Yeah, I suppose Hello. so. Yeah? Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a few things have changed since that video. Uh, the number of citizens have increased to close to 7,000. 7, um, it covers every continent on the planet apart from Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And yeah, a few other things that I should mention. The concept is allowing people to choose their own form of governance. So what people don't realize right now mm -hmm. is when you vote, you have two choices in most cases. Uh, we have more choices in what tea to buy, what cigarettes to buy, what food to buy than we do in governance. Um, we select one and they represent for four years. And those who didn't select it have to just put up with it. If you really look at this model, it's, it's quite outdated. With the progression of technology and our ability to be able to communicate over the globe, we should have better choices. I mean, if 40% of people, uh, let's say in the case, 40% of people vote for someone and 20% don't and another 20% vote for someone else, you're looking at, you know, 40% left over and 20 will just exclude just for the sake of conversation, um, that didn't choose that person. So now they have to put up with that for four years. And for me, this makes no sense. Just, go on, sorry. No, yeah, yeah, no, 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 sorry, finish, finish what you wanted yeah. to say, excuse me. So it's quite amazing that when you go into a shopping center, you have, you know, 50 different brands of tea to choose from. But with governance, we only have two to choose from, and which is more important. I don't really care about which tea, well, I do, I love my tea. But um, I would much rather have the same uh, allocation and circumstances provided for something much greater, which is governance. Um, a second thing that you can look at is that there is no competition in governance. Um, you know, you lobby your way through it. External uh, input is, you know, dissolved into blacks, into, you know, nothingness. 98% um, of small businesses fail. Those 2% that make it become something great. So why don't we have, again, the same kind of format for governance? Why isn't there competition between governance? And this, for me, again, is quite alarming because once you choose someone and there's no competition, they can go on about doing their day. They don't need to improve. With Bid Nation, the idea is to introduce competition in governance. So maybe someone provides best certificates in a better format at a cheaper rate. Um, so therefore, we're going to go to them for that. If someone else provides another service at a better rate, so why don't we go to them for that? Rather than going it all into a centra uh, central aspect. May, may, I, may, I, uh, may I interrupt you? Of course. Okay. Because what I thought, what I, I liked so much in the idea, uh, two years ago, we, we, I met here someone of the U. And HCR, who learned me that there are so many people who are stateless, who have no passport at all, much more people than we, we do think. And um, the fact that we, for example, I, I, I suppose all of us have a passport, that if you have a passport, you have an identity, you can get into assurances, whatever, you can get your ki children to school, whatever. But there's so many people without a passport and with so many people on the run, they lose their, their uh, nationality and it's so hard to get another one. And I, I thought that that was also a starting point from, from BitNation, that why should we be dependent on national administrations to get a passport if we can create something different where everybody can have an identity and have a passport and also then get assured, etc., etc. Was that a starting point to for for BitNation also? Yeah, that and among uh, other things. Um, the passport was introduced, and I'm so sorry, I should know this, but I 
I think it was World War One or World War Two. I think it was World War One. Um, it was introduced after that, kind of uh, yeah. you know around Europe as a as a temporary solution. Yeah. Um, from there, we've seen it grow, 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 and it's become this uh, you know uh, detrimental thing to people's privacy, their ability to move from country yeah, to country. True. Prior we, to that, you could World move War anywhere. The uh, first World War, people didn't, uh, in Europe, most people didn't have a passport yeah. and could travel wherever they wanted. That's how my grandfathers, for example, traveled through, through Europe and, and stranded here in the Netherlands. Yeah. And isn't that funny? Instead of yeah. going forward with the introduction of technology and all those things, we've kind of gone backwards yeah. and introduced you know, biometrics and all these other you know, personal invading uh, technologies. And I think it's terrible. You know, we, we live in a time where security needs to be better, but not at the cost of personal privacy, at the cost of personal uh, ability to move freely. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're doing it that way, you're really not looking into the solution properly. If that's the only solution, um, then it's not very well. It's like a parent uh, putting a tracking device on their kids and putting cameras on them because they just don't know when one kid's gonna act out. I mean, that's not the correct thing to do, is it? Um, so in the same manner, that's very important. And bringing it back to refugee aspect, if I may mention something that I've just written down. Um, the biggest Syrian refugee camp in Jordan um, hosts over 550,000 refugees. Um, it's the fifth largest city in Jordan. Um, there are 10 to 15 babies born every day there. Um, and what was really interesting, um, there's a gentleman from Germany who is really good at management in these sort of areas. and. You know, he was sent there to manage it, and he found out that a lot of, there was a lot of violence, there was a lot of, uh, you know, things going wrong, and he came to the conclusion that the reason people are doing this is because he's looking at them as numbers. He's going, all right, there's 20,000 people here, they need 20 calories, uh, 2,000 calories worth of food, you need one, t uh, one tenth per eight people, and doing it very systematically. And he came to the c conclusion that, no, you can't do this. Each person has their own desires, their own feelings, and you can't approach them as numbers and statistics. Um, at the end of it, they ended up creating 3,000 small businesses, the refugees themselves. They went from you know, begging for food to having shops where they can walk in and purchase food with coupons. Yeah. This is uh, uplifting. This is, this is uh, you know, for me, a nicer way of approaching it, letting people decide for themselves what they want to do. I mean, the biggest uh, threat to humanity is Ivy League people, you know, I, I don't mean to offend anyone, but do-gooders, uh, uh, who go into countries and presume they know better on how people should live. Yeah. Um, you've seen the same example. Without asking people what their desires are. Exactly. You've seen the same thing in Afghanistan. You've seen the same thing in many Middle Eastern mm -hmm. countries where they, you know, you've got Harvard, Ivy League yeah, people going in there and yeah. going, oh, you know, in my university we were taught to do this. But it's like, no, that's not how it works. People are people. Um, in some parts of Middle East, bribing is it culture. It's, it's rude to not do it. And then these people come from external sources like, no, no more bribing. This is, this is fraud. And they don't really understand the culture. They don't understand what's really going on. And they're trying to install one system f you know, for the entire country. And this is very wrong. You know. It is unnatural for millions of people to follow the same rules. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Um, another thing, you know, we've got to look at external services, such as the UN uh, Human Rights Council. Like, why are countries like Saudi Arabia, where beheading is done, and you know, they impeached on Yemen's uh, Human Rights Act, they attacked schools, hospitals, why were they firstly um, elected as the Human Rights Council, and why were they re-elected as the Human Rights Council? Meanwhile, other countries who, who don't do anywhere close to that are sanctioned and you know, put into the dark corner. So these are very, very alarming things. Um, and then last thing, just before I leave it, um, you know, we have a society where we're told, you know, take shorter showers, you know, spend less time, you know, try and save as much as water as you can. And you know, I looked it up on the European Union, clearly, statistically, in 2009, 35% of uh, water usage was from agriculture, fishing, and forestry. In 2014, this number increased to 41%. During this entire time, household usage is only 9%. You know, you know, we live in a society where the guilt is passed down to the citizens, where they're not even responsible for it. And everyone's like, oh, I shouldn't wash my hands for so long, I shouldn't take showers. It's, it's negligible, 9%, compared to 41%. Um, and the water usage, you know, I mean, this is just some of it. Um, UNESCO put it out, used by agriculture, 80% of water used, the, you know, why do we pass the blame? Mm -hmm. no, never do we look at the industries and corporations and, you know, things like that. Okay. So, this is a wrong emphasis. Um, uh, then we go to questions, but uh, I would like to <laughs> introduce Charles. Uh, talking about people giving them their in independency, that is something you practice. 
uh, by uh, uh, developing and, and introducing and, and selling uh, solar yep. lamps. Yep. How do you do that? Uh, and where? Yeah, uh, we started World Solar Fund. Uh, I, most of you might know uh, Waka Waka Lamp. I was involved uh, right from the beginning. Uh, only I didn't like the concept uh, where we let people buy one solar lamp before we can donate one to Africa. So that is a completely system which I disagree that doesn't work. Uh, so I've been traveling a lot in many uh, African countries and uh, we noticed that the development, uh, uh, Africa is growing and we talk about growth uh, every time six percent, seven percent growth, but sometimes they have inflation of 14 percent, so the growth is rubbish. It doesn't make any sense. So because there are still communities in the village who will never have electricity if we still keep waiting. So that's why we have developed a very small and efficient solar lamp that we give people light. There are communities that will never be able to buy a television. They, um, they don't even need it. So, but they still rely on oil lamp. But one thing technology have uh, uh, made possible is that more than 80% of the people all have smartphones. And uh, to my greatest surprise, uh, when I was in Zambia... Uh, you just came back from Zambia. I just yeah, came back yeah. from Zambia. We went to the Kasama region, northern province, very close to Tanzania border. And uh, I met one lady there. She explained some certain things in the iPhone I was using, which I didn't know it had that function. So Africans are more ahead with mobile telephones than we here. Uh, so, <laughs> but one of their problems is that when their telephone, when the battery is out, they have to send somebody who rides up to 300, uh, 400 kilometers to another city to go and charge it. And it takes some days before he comes back again and delivers the phones. So, but uh, <laughs> that, that works. But that's why we, we just have a very simple lamp. It's a green sunlight. Just five hours in the sun. It is fully loaded. The first one is to check if, if it is full. And this one goes on for eight hours long. The second goes for 20 hours. And this last is for 60 hours. And? You can use it as a charger as well? Yeah, you can. Uh, it has a USB. You can charge all your smartphones with it. It's a very strong product here. We are selling it in the Netherlands uh, for 36 euros. That's 50% uh, waka waka. The same function is 68 euros. So we say we make it very cheap. But what makes what, you, what, what solar phone unique is that um, we are not giving it for free. People in the villages, they all buy kerosene. They buy oil, oil lamp. So what we do is, we want to produce this lamp in their community to create job there. And we give them the opportunity to buy this lamp where they pay at least $50 cent every month. So that in the next three, four, five years, they have finished paying it. And the money that comes back will be used for somebody else. So this is our, our phone, how we unit. We are not giving it for free. We want them to pay for it. Yeah. And in extreme cases, when people can't pay, that's another different yeah, issue. Okay. Yep. Okay. How does this connect with reforming the United Nations? Yeah, uh, <laughs> how, how it connects is the, there's a, when I also check uh, the beat nation, I say, hey, people in Africa in these communities will like it. But how do they, they if they don't have the uh, possibility to access with that mobile telephone, uh, it gives them the opportunity to get the information to engage in the rest of the world. So we know right now that uh, mobile, most of these communities don't have any television uh, senders. Uh, and, uh, so mobile is, is, a very uh, um, is very, very important in the daily lives. In, in real lives, in communication, for their exchanging bank, uh, market prices for their good. Yeah. Uh, medication, etc. For yeah. their medication, yeah. for their banking, without break of uh, uh, yeah. diseases, people can okay. access 
clear. Yep. Thank you. Who has uh, any any questions, remarks? Is there a business model? Or is it, uh, Why is it called fund? Is it something that you depend on donations, or is it based on the business model? Uh, well, what solar fund? Uh, we are not a uh, business model. We are supposed to work together with uh, some microfinances uh, in Zambia, but we didn't do that because they are asking almost 60% uh, rent, which is outrageous. Uh, so sometimes 75% uh, rent. So we we are just uh, we are just new. We started. So we don't, we don't want to earn money with it. We just want uh, to make the lamp available to people in the villages. And here also people use it here in the Netherlands, uh, people who, who go to camping. So we are just trying to replace, uh, because it's very, very strange that in this time, there are still people who use oil lamp. The same money they spend on oil lamp in, a, in one year, they already have the pay this lamp. Yeah. Yep. That's clear. Other other questions. Uh, Where is it produced? Where yes. Uh, this lamp is right at the moment it's been assembled. The software is Dutch. The man that uh, developed it is uh, used to work before for Philips and um, the electronic is Dutch. It's been assembled in Bulgaria. We are, we are now busy trying to start, out, start up the first assembly uh, plant in Kasama. That's in the northern province here of Zambia. Because the lamps Africans use, we also want to make them in Africa. Okay. So what we use here in Holland, we make it here, here in Europe. Who of you, who of you, because I need to change, I have to keep a bit in, uh, in uh, up uh, <laughs> track here. Yeah. I have to speed up a little bit, but, but all these questions will come back in the workshops, I hope. But who of you would say, yeah, I would like to become a member of BitNation, I will do that right away. I already am. You are. <laughs> <laughs> and why would you like to do that? Can, could you... Just very simple, just more choice. More, more yeah. choice. Choice in what? L let me first check the website and see what <laughs> kind of choice. Another person who said, yes, I would love to be a member of the Fit Nation. I would be in the inhabitants. Why? Because you can help the inhabitants. It's just an interesting concept as a whole. Uh, I think everyone feels that there is something about to change. And I think uh, that's a hint about where to go, where to go next. Yeah, so it's uh, interesting at, at the very least. Can I just uh, add something quickly? Yes. If you look at the traditional monetary system, so you've got euros in the region of Europe and US dollars in some other regions, including the United States, uh, which is used internationally as the dominant currency, uh, what happens is that these become your only choices. So you can compare this relatively to <laughs> governance. And what happens is now we've got Bitcoin. And Bitcoin allows self-expression on a monetary aspect that we've never had before. And this really shows the empowerment of the individual being able to choose what currency suits them. And as a gentleman said that, in Africa they have M-Pesa. And M-Pesa has been used for a long time, which is mobile credit um, for form of payment. So they are, as you know, he said, uh, miles ahead of the traditional you know, countries in using such methods. So if you take Bitcoin and uh, these virtual currencies, you, know, you can even select their own currency. It doesn't have to be Bitcoin. Bitcoin is open source, which means I can say, well, I don't like these aspects of it and change it based on my philosophical understanding or whatever it may be and put it out there. And this allows empowerment of the individual and collectivism because uh, you know, they go hand in hand in such a scenario. And we also empower localization rather than um, you know, looking at let's give all of Europe one currency, which hasn't worked very well, has it? Um, it's worked for major countries such as Germany and you know, the powerful countries, but it was meant to reduce their power and give more power to the southern countries, but it has done the opposite, and it has drained these countries. You know, Greece is gonna become one of, you know, one of the first privately owned countries due to the amount of debt they have. And you know, this is terrible you know, that you can even allow for this to happen. So the lesson to learn is the localization always works. I mean, look at Switzerland, it's a decentralized country. Um, each state had their own say, and they have seven people that they choose, and none of them have more power than the other. There's a lot about to say. <laughs> they were a bit backward <laughs> for a long time. 
only in 79 women got the right to vote. So the <laughs> there, there is some history about that as well. But that is goes too far. But it, it, it is what we, well, what we like about what you tell, and I am sorry that I have to, to end this for now, is that you get an idea about everywhere the system is cracking. People feel that. If it's in your national elections, or if it's in European elections, or if it's in UN, context, we are missing things because the world is changing very fast and our needs are different than 70 years ago. Um, and we want to have another form of influence. And how can we match forms of, of, of uh, independency of citizens in formal bodies? Because we need some organization everywhere. Yeah. So, in my view, there is a discipline which is uh, specifically uh, um, specifically with this in mind, and it's called the business analyst. And I was wondering if the UN ever has worked with a business analyst to see if they can improve their pipeline. A business analyst, yeah. But uh, we ha also have President Trump, who is a businessman. <laughs> and <laughs> he's, he's not, he's not a Exactly right. He's a businessman. I'm talking about a business analyst who's uh, who has um, studied, <laughs> st has done the study for this. Um, like, for instance, um, uh, doing simple pipeline research of beginning and end. Because the sense I have of the UN is that most of the time people get caught up in a bit of an emotional state where the emotions run wild and the motivation is always good. That's, that's not the thing. But when people get frustrated in a way of not getting things done, that's where I think a business analyst could be valuable. For so long. We'll come back. You will join the, the, working, uh, the workshops as well and then uh, see what kind of, what your input has, has for an effect. Thank you so much. Other ways of alternatives, I, will, uh, I uh, would like to introduce to you Mohamed Badran. He is a uh, world famous uh, stu Dutch student now, <laughs> with roots in Syria, studying uh, cultural anthropology at the VU in Amsterdam. And he yes. spoke to the United Nations. And we have that on the short film. Let us hope that today's summit will be different and that international community is going to share responsibility for refugees and agrees to take action on the following. To end the violence now in Syria and protect civilians. To guarantee safe routes for all refugees and to stop put our lives on hold. To empower refugees to, be, to lead projects for refugees so that we can help our people to provide access to higher education for all young refugees so that we can return and rebuild our homes in the future. My last message to you, world leaders, in our small way, refugees are already taking the action. We want world leaders to do the same. Thank you. And I would like to introduce to you Audi Fax Nadiu Torre. Also Dutch, but from, uh, from, from Burundi. I, I don't have a small film to introduce you, uh, but uh, you were very active in uh, politics, weren't you, in, in I'm Burundi? St I'm still very active. You're yeah. still very yes, active yes, in I politics, yeah. Actually, you should have many films, because now as we are talking about genocide in Burundi, yeah. so there should be a lot of films concerning Burundi yeah, at this moment. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, of course. Um, uh, Mohammed, how did you get to the United States? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Can you do that again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me try. If that <laughs> no, I won't do it again. How did you get so far that you, you were able to, to, to talk to the world leaders in the, in the UN meeting? 
Okay. When was it? When was it? It was um, last year. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, half a year ago. Or something. Yeah, in yeah. September. Yeah. So at yeah. the beginning of September. And uh, the, the thing is that, um, yeah, I work for the organization. I actually established here an organization together with other uh, Syrian refugees, my friends, which is called Syrian Volunteers in the Netherlands. It's a Syrian civil society organization that we work on empowering refugees to, to become an active citizens in the Dutch society so that they can develop uh, social projects and be like really engaged in the Dutch society, uh, work for other refugees, but also work for the Dutch society. Uh, we believe that uh, in volunteer work, so we take volunteer work as an entry point where we can uh, empower uh, refugees to start uh, as an active citizens in the society. So uh, through my work in the organization, I've been, uh, I, yeah, I applied as uh, the rest of the, the other civil society organizations. And we, we got lucky, I think. And we have been chosen uh, as one of the uh, nine speakers uh, at this summit. Um, yeah, I, I was actually the only, yeah, the only uh, organization that is actually representing uh, refugee, refugee voices or migration voices, but also uh, the Syrian uh, refugee uh, problem. So, uh, so there was actually a lot of pressure, but at the same time, uh, you know, I felt like, uh, yeah, I, I need to carry a lot in a, in a three, four minutes at a time. Yeah. Um. I will say for from an apropos, sorry. <laughs> yeah. What you mentioned in your speech is very interesting because it, 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 it is, is a completely uh, follow, a follow up of what we just discussed that people want to contribute themselves to build up their society. Um, is that, do you have an explanation why this idea has floated so far away in the UN? I mean, if we if we look at every uh, model of governance, but not not in a in a United Nation, but also I mean uh, in in our national uh, governments, it always come, c comes up with a, with a top down policies uh, without engaging the citizens, whether it, it is in building the, the, their their community, whether it's building uh, their government, whether it's building the, the the policies that they that that, that will actually govern the govern govern the, the whole citizens. Uh, from from this notion, I think all the policies, all the work, all even the development work that that is being approached, it's 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 all uh, it's always with a uh, top-down uh, approaches. Um, what we are right now are actually we are trying to propose is uh, you know uh, uh, the other way around. So we would like to really uh, empower, like show the empowerment of refugee. Um, you know, refugees also. Uh, many people look look at uh, refugee as an identity rather than you know just an experience. Um, it is actually it's, it is actually not an identity. It is that you experienced something very terrible, but at the end you can uh, take it back and you can build from that moment. Um, since people they look they victimize refugees, um, uh, you might also uh, don't give the chance that they can develop themselves. They can actually do something. Yeah. So um, from this idea, I think it is also we can say that all citizens, they should somehow be active in, uh, in, in, in contributing uh, with whether, you know, whether uh, policy making or designing or thinking project, developmental projects to, to, to reach uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, the global, the new global structure that we are aiming for. Do you recognize that, Audifax? Yes, I do. And, um, because we knew, do we know where Burundi is? Burundi is south of Rwanda, <laughs> and it's a very uh, there's a high population, dense population. There are a lot of refugees living in Ru in uh, Burundi as well, and there is a lot of violence going on. Correct. Yeah. So um, I think it's a nice thing that we organized this meeting, and I was thinking it's a good thing for me to be here, just as um, seven days we were celebrating the liberation of the Netherlands. And then when I was looking at the festivities, so I, was, I saw there were the presentation of the uh, representative of nations which have you know, been involved into the liberation movement. So we saw Canadians, Americans, and uh, other countries. So why I think this is very interesting is we have to look at people who are in power. 
these people, they have, let me say, everything. And most of the time, when you have, you know, everything for your own, it is not easy to, look, to go and look down. Because you are there, you are high, everything is high. Look at how these, we call, you know, high leaders, world leaders, how they are protected. When we go, to, we, they have chance to go and look at the little refugees. Nobody's care. No one is caring about them. So this is the gap which is there. And the UN now represent one of these uh, model of society. When we see those who are very high, once they have gone to up the stairs, going down becomes really a difficult issue. So they don't know what is taking down there. Sometimes they don't even care. Um, um, this is what happened with me when I went back to Burundi after spending 15, 16 years in the Netherlands. You know, um, it's good that we sometimes have opportunities to be in countries where we are learning something positive. When we see how people are respecting each other, so we see how people are treating one another. When we see how ministers are going and meeting, you know, people, you know, on the, in the, on the workshop, in the work areas, or whatever. But um, this is a great issue, and we should be very, very concerned. Because when I was looking at those festivities, I was, my mind was struck because I thought, do we know that the same danger we had in Second World War is not far away from us. And how are we going to deal with that today? Are we aware that the danger is still there, the potentiality of those issues are there? And what are we doing at this moment? So we let this be dealt by the people who are very high, that's fine. But what, what should we do as citizens? How you, much are we do concerned? You have a, do you have a proposal yeah. Looking at the aim of, of to, today's meeting, in a way, I spoke to you before on telephone and you said UN is, is represented in Burundi yes. and is witnessing the cruelties and, and counting the deaths and wounded people, etc. But they cannot do more. Yeah. And what would you like them, what, what kind of difference could be made, for example, if we take Burundi as an example? Yes, when in we a take crisis situation. Yes, when we take Burundi as an example, and actually, I don't understand the failures the UN has been making. So, Burundi is a small country in Africa, a neighboring Rwanda. And I think the genocide in Rwanda is well known worldwide. So, how did the UN let a genocide happen in Rwanda? And now the same red signals are already pointing out in Burundi and still the UN keeping silent. Nobody can understand it. Yeah. So um, for me, when I was on the street of Bujumbura demonstrating with young boys, young girls, because nobody could, you know, again, as I think about the liberation, we have to figure out how many people in the world today are living in oppression. We should have those figures. And the UN should be publicizing these figures because this is awful to see that these people are eating every day while they have people who are starving in their own countries. And these are the people when they come to say, you know, red carpet in UN, whatever the leaders who were there when we were talking, they are there. But these are butchers, these are killers, and nobody cares. And the UN does not care. So, you know, sometimes I get very angry when I think of the work UN is doing and thinking how we as citizens, we should shake the UN and say, come on, guys, it's time for things to change. And if we don't do it ourselves, the UN will not change by itself because they are the same, you know, numbers of people. They know how to select each other or whatever. So we will select leaders, but once they go there, you know, they can't do much. So we were talking about the UN um, Security Council. Let us give you just an example. Last time when there were um, a UN resolution in Burundi, that was vetoed by Russia. Yeah. And China was silent. Two days ago, the minister of uh, the, the, the vice president of China was in Burundi. And he said, I will support you, president, whatever you want. 
Still, this man, as the UN is saying, when we will see the report that, that has been done by the one who is in charge of the human rights, whom I met in Burundi, we discussed a lot, and the, uh, the one who is in charge of the prevention of genocide, they are saying something worse can happen in that region. So now I'm thinking the vice president of a nation being a permanent member of the UN, go there and say, we support you, whatever you do. Yep. Understandable. So, yeah. I mean, it's, so yeah, what, well, it's what I'm proposing... If, if <laughs> we know what their other interests yes, are. Yes, so what I'm proposing <laughs> is simple. We have thirst to be sure as citizens. And most of you know, the people who are living in this you know, modern society, developed countries, where we can have you know, all information coming from different parts of the world. Yeah. So we must be ready to say no to a certain number of things. Yeah. So second, in a model of uh, thinking about the working of um, the, uh, the bureaucratic you know, UN, we should be thinking all the reports are there. And it's good, they have the reports. But what are doing those reports? Yeah. So uh, that's why I'm thinking UN should have what I call preventive measures, whatever the, the line, you know, the signal are turning red, they should have preventive measures which are there. Of course, chapter seven of the, the, uh, chapter seven of the Charter of the United States, or the United yes. Nations, says, you know, um, they can jump into a country when they see thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of people dead, but it's too late. Why do you have to wait yeah. till that moment? So this is where I'm thinking yeah. a new model of reshaping it's clear. the UN. It's very clear, and, and I think you do agree. That there is this, this feeling of a real lack of where are, the, where are the voices of the people concerned. It's, it's too much about nations and uh, the people leading these nations and to less about the citizens, and the voices of the citizens, and making them, giving them the force to act for themselves, to protect themselves, to raise themselves, to work for themselves, to educate their children, etc., and being part of of, of being he he heard and and uh, being part of the solution instead of being only part of a problem. Um, a few questions and we'll continue, then we have more time to discuss with each other. Um, I understand what is being said, but on the other hand, when we have a situation, especially of armed conflict, that you have people trying to do for themselves, uh, isn't it a slippery slope that you end up with militias and more armed people and more violence? So don't we need like, structures and mechanisms to avoid that? And then you turn to states and then you... I think it's wonderful what you said, and empowering the people is very, very good. It's, it's the beginning of everything, but empower them in their own uh, government. That's most important, I think, because we cannot implement democracy or anti-corruption law or anti or bad behavior of government from the outside. It has to start inside of the country and by the people themselves. When we try Iraq or other countries where we do it by force or where the United States did it by force, it always failed. So that's my question. What do you think? It's, is it not that we have to empower the people to create a democra democratic government but in their own country first? I do. Yeah, thanks a lot to the both of you. Uh, my question is to Audifax. Um, you described the current situation and the UN on uh, actually not acting. How would you then reshape the UN in its current form or the world order or create a new UN to deal with issues like uh, the violence in Burundi and yeah. Yeah, how can we actually prevent it? Yeah, this is a very large, big question. And, <laughs> and, 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 and there's, not a, no, there's not an easy answer on that. 
So I, I, I'm so sorry, but I would like you to, to do this in, in the next uh, session. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have, I have uh, something to, to, to reflect on as well, because what we also know from all these experiences from, from humanitarian aid and, and international relationships, that if a state has a strong bureaucracy, which is controllable, accountable, and where, for example, there is a good tax system, that is very important to build up a country if there is a lack of that, if people all go for themselves and there is no cooperation, what the lady here mentioned already, people will protect themselves in militias or factions or whatever. Are we then not, how can we deal with new forms of nationship? Do I meet to answer? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, Do you have a clue? It's also a very big question. Yes. But I, I want you to, to reflect on that. Okay, we'll leave it. <laughs> leave it. Leave it. Okay. It's not fair. It's not fair. My fault. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, le <laughs> let us be honest. The world has been evolving. I think where we were after the first, second, first world, world war, the second world war, we are not there this moment. So we have today information which is flowing, of course. But we have this idea of dominion. Because um, by being honest, I would say, when I look at the different wars taking place in the world, they are much more economic provoked wars. Let me say um, Syria we do know some information about how the situation in Syria started. Of course, there have been the situation, okay, I can give the example of Libya. We know the example of um, other countries. So what I would say is, the UN should first, when I was seeing the alarming you know, signals. So when the signals start to be alarming, when you see people getting killed, while the UN does remain still, and this is from that point, when people getting, you know, um, the human, you know, human rights not being respected in a country. Before even coming to the situation of militias and war, the UN should jump into. But the UN today does not jump into because there is within the five permanent members of the UN, the situation trying to control geostrategically this area and that area. So what needs it to be brought to the table is Russia, China, US, France, and UK. Yeah. Come on, guys. Yeah. You need to put things in order. Right. And I think another element. No, when no, we I saw, when we now. saw this, when we saw this, yes, yes. When we saw this crisis of refugees flowing from everywhere to Europe. I think from that moment, rather than condemning our government so whatever, so whatever, we should have said, you know, the UN, you have to do something. Our leaders in Europe, you have to do something. Force the UN to do something. The Americans, of course, they are leaders in the world. So, in, so that's why I'm saying we need the UN to find those majors the, between the five permanent members. But the voice has to come from us citizens. Say, so you must do something. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to contribute? Uh, I last just, word? Yeah, I just, just actually want to, to thank you and also add a couple of things. I mean, uh, it is also um, how, you know, to respect our, the, the whole human rights uh, with, all, uh, with all the citizens, with all uh, the nations. Um, how much actually is being... Uh, you know, uh, raising the awareness on the human rights issues uh, with also the uh, with all the with all the citizens, so that the, you know they they can adopt it and they can also respect it. Uh, the thing is, uh, it has always have been seen because I'm, I also came from the Middle East, where always been seen to the to the United Nations as you know coming from the West, and also the uh, the human rights is also coming from the West. But how far can we uh, also see and agreed on this gr uh, human rights? Uh, you know, uh, the West and in the Middle East, and everybody agreeing on the same human rights and respect it. So therefore, I think I think engaging engaging the citizens from from the first very stage in the thinking and designing and implementing any policy is very important. Okay, so far, 
because after this we have a short break. Yeah. Um, can you come back? I, I, uh oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I just had a few remarks to make. Um, you know, I read, I read something interesting in regards to what you said um, with the UN. Um, the thing is, you know, these centralized authorities and, you know, people, you know, you can call them states people, whatever it is, uh, you know, very rarely do we look at the lives of the people and, you know, we take our messages from such organizations, but very rarely do we go on the ground and speak to the citizens that are going through these scenarios. And in most scenarios, if you speak to the people, they, they just want peace, you know, they, they don't care what Iraq is doing, what Afghanistan is doing, what all these people are doing, they just want to be safe. And what, what the mistake is in our society is that we allow these choices of let's go over there and like help these people uh, be done by centralized authorities, and this is terrible. I mean, if you look at the Iraq war, most people were against it, but they just did it anyways. And where was the weapons of mass destruction? We didn't even get found, but no one cares. They're not liable for it. But millions of people died. Millions of people died in Iraq. A lot of soldiers from the <coughs> United States died, and they thought they were doing a patriotic thing. You know, and these are fundamental uh, you know, wrongdoings of being given the authority of making the decision. And all of those fundings come from my tax money, your tax money. The government doesn't <laughs> make money on themselves. Um, you know, and in regards to Africa, there was a lady who works as a journalist in the African News in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. And she mentioned that very little news, even in the, in the news source that she works in, is from Africa. Um, you know, very rarely does anything reach the front cover. It's always like a little section in the back. But God forbid something happens in the Western world, every front newspaper covers it. A little girl got hit today. But people are dying by the thousands in Africa. If not, you know, Rwanda was terrible. Uh, one of the founders of Bid Nation worked in Africa, in many parts of Africa. He was there. He said, I saw bodies in thousands coming down the rivers. And this is terrible. He actually um, got an MBA from the Queen by, by coming into it. Just I'll wrap it up. Um, I just think the best thing the international communities can do is just uh, stay out of affairs. Like, you know, why is the Netherlands in, in Syria? It's got nothing to do with, you know, the Netherlands. These countries just need to go back. You know, unless Syria asks for it, then we're breaking international law. And if, you know... Syria. Unless Syria asks for it, who's Syria? It's the leader. That's the problem. No, but then who's Trump? <coughs> but then we're saying who's Trump, that we shouldn't select him as the president. But he is the president, so deal with it. You know what I mean? Then that's the way it is. And unless they ask for it, the people go out and like start a parade, come and take over our country and help us stay out of it. I mean, that's how it simply it works. Um, and if these you know, organizations such as the UN um, are breaking international law, countries are breaking international law, which we all agreed to after World War II, um, to follow the UN, that was the purpose of it. And if they're not following the rules, then why are we kidding ourselves? You know, if the governments don't follow the rule, then I'd rather be an outlaw myself. That's just what I'm going to say. Thank you. <laughs> One, two last remarks, and then we'll start with, with our discussion, because otherwise you have nothing else to find. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. First of all, I want to thank um, everybody, of course, but especially our defects. Yeah. Um, I want to give an example. Um, uh, half year ago, I think almost one year ago, there was uh, in east of Turkey, in uh, in Gizre, Kurdish uh, city, um, there were war, um, and there was a girl who was killed, 14 year old girl who was killed by the soldiers, and the mother kept that body in the uh, freezer almost one week, one and a half week. At that time, we asked here the newspaper to put on the news, but the newspaper, they really, um, they told us we can't do it because we have this agreement with Turkey about refugees. So these kind of things are so important here. Even, even uh, Amnesty International told us it is very sensitive topic. We can't do it. Just two remarks, quick remarks. One is, uh, I think it's very important to understand that the UN is a collection of governments. It's not the collection of 
the people who live in the world. So the governments do have a different interest and perspective in, uh, to, in that. I think that's, that's very important to, to, to look, to realize. Look, in, in the countries uh, where there is a democracy, so you could assume that the government representing you, but in, in non-democratic countries, it is not the case. So that's very important. So to, to tackle this, I think there are two things that we need to agree on. That's, I think, fundamentally, the human rights issues. The human rights issue encompasses, you know, it, does, it doesn't stop at the border. Everybody has, everyone has inborn rights. That's the human right, huh? we have that. The second thing I think which needs to be, uh, uh, which needs to be developed thoroughly is democracy <laughs> principle. Huh? So uh, we have to account countries also in terms of a certain democratic principles that they have to follow. We cannot accept countries having, uh, you know, governments winning election year after year and maybe six times, 10 times until they die and maybe his son comes up and takes up. We cannot accept that in the UN. I think that's also an important yeah. point. Yeah. It's an unequal representation. Okay, till so far. I would like to introduce you before we, because we're going to split up. May I answer Half to of a you, sorry, sorry. May I answer to a question that was raised up? No, I want okay, you discu to okay. discuss it because then we will sp sit here. Which is okay if you like so, but I think to give more people the floor and, 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 and the opportunity to speak out, we'll split up in, in two groups. And I would like to introduce you because we have two very professionals in this, and that is uh, Professor Joost Herman from Groningen. May, may, do you mind to, to come down? You may. And we have Peter van der Vliet. Where are you? Oh, you're sitting just in front of me. <laughs> um, who is uh, in, uh, 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 working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and has a long time experience in, as a diplomat at the UN. And um, the both of you will have short, will ask you some nasty questions to reflect on. That will be the starting po point for a discussion which we hope have an outcome that you make two or three proposals in reshaping the United Nations. Because we are part of this contest, the Swedish contest, and we want to win it. <laughs> I don't know if there's any money or whatever, or uh, celebrity. Five, 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 five million? Okay, we'll go, we'll go, go. We'll share it only, we we'll keep it in between us. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we get a percentage. Yes, we'll share it, it'll only do us. And Joost Hermie came in a bit uh, later, but you understood that where we where we where we are now is that there is there is a little there is a frustration on the UN is you made very good um, uh, you wrapped it very well up <laughs> made a good summary this representation in, in governments is not representing the needs and and wishes of 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 citizens you are leaving tomorrow for Indonesia uh, does your visit has to do anything what we are discussing here? Well, definitely, for sure. Uh, first of all, sorry I was late. Uh, it took me an hour to drive around to find the parking spot. <laughs> and when I finally found the parking spot, it started to rain as a result of which I'm soaked. Oh. Um, <laughs> but that shows also my determination to be here. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, as, a, as a professor in the Groningen University, um, my chair is called Globalization Studies and Humanitarian Action. Uh, we do devote particular attention, both in terms of research and education, on patterns of widening, scale enlarged uh, human and institutional interaction vis-à-vis uh, -vis the, the downside of this ongoing process of globalization, which more often than not results in conflict and in human, uh, human uh, humanitarian emergencies. Um, from that perspective, uh, the quality and the functioning of intergovernmental institutions, the gentleman reminded us, of course, what the United Nations are, intergovernmental. Uh, the function of these uh, institutions uh, have to be addressed from 
the cluster of interests that citizens nowadays around the world share with one another on a global scale. That's called the, the a theory of deterritorialization. <coughs> sorry for the word. Uh, and it is there, I believe, that we have to be much more creative in while accepting the more or less legal status quo of the way how the United Nations after 1945 were put together. Uh, uh, while accepting that, that we should focus much more on that part of the United Nations, let's for argument's sake say the Social and Economic Council and the, the, the independent agencies underneath it, uh, that do already have built up this global uh, codex of norms in all realms of human interaction, what we deem to be at a global scale to be relevant, and connect that to um, a multi-stakeholder mix of uh, civic uh, action, uh, public-private partnerships, and uh, interest organizations to focus on these areas in order from bottom up, but also from top down, to force the formal representatives, the governments, to allow for action in that particular sphere. What are you going to discuss in Indonesia? In Indonesia, we are there to uh, help create uh, a research and academic uh, uh, knowledge build-up uh, in the realm of uh, natural disaster management and disaster preparedness and resilience. Also topics that pro forma the Indonesian government takes very close to its heart, obviously. Uh, the nickname of Indonesia is the, the supermarket of disaster. But at a local grassroots level, uh, the support of the government for people really to shape their own lives and to become resilient and to become not dependent upon top-down aid uh, is lacking way behind the words that uh, the government uh, issues every time. So that is clear. And Peter van der Vliet. Is it what we discuss here is, is you hear that more often, I suppose. Um, no. what, what I hear a lot is a talk about the UN and people mentioning the UN. And then I always ask myself, what, what do people mean when they say the UN? And I, the, only this gentleman actually said something about it. So I've pulled up the, uh, from the UN uh, website the chart that describes the UN system. Um, and it's a patchwork <coughs> of different... Uh, entities and organizations and forums and, and, and funds and programs, etc. So my advice uh, would be uh, to, if you talk about the UN, first to define what you mean. Because often uh, the UN is indeed the member states or us member states. So if you say the UN should do more about Syria or the UN should do more about uh, uh, Burundi, as this gentleman also said, we're, re we're really talking about the Security Council in this, in this case, and more specifically about the P5, the five permanent members who happen to hold the uh, veto. So if you say the UN should do more about Syria, if, if the Russian Federation or China blocks it, uh, then we're, we're, it's, you're, you're done. Uh, so, and I think this is an encouragement also to uh, if we, uh, we go into these uh, uh, working groups, if you want to come up with an alternative system of governance, because basically, although the UN was formed in San Francisco in 1945, uh, the, the, the international system where states are basically the central uh, unit already exists in 1648. That's the Westphalia system. So if you want to replace uh, states, or you want to change or replace the UN, uh, what would you like to replace it with? Okay. Um, so that's, that's very important. One also, another important remark is form follows function. So uh, if you don't start with structures, but start with what would you like to see change? What would you like to achieve? And what is the form that fits best with, with that? So those are a few uh, uh, basically tips to, uh, to go as we go into these working groups. Who says I would like to join Joost Herman? <laughs> I want, uh, uh, because we, we need to have a, sh a fair sh share. I don't know exactly. Did you count how many people were there? Or shall we just do just so? It's like the Dead Sea. Yeah? Yeah? Let's see. We do the Dead Sea. Okay. You go with Joost Herman. You stay here in the room. And you, this part goes with Peter van der Vliet. And we go to the... 
Ja, yeah, upstairs the Napolitania room or something. I don't know exactly. <laughs> Uh, so we need a one Yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, I want someone. Uh, we stay in this room, but we can have we have a short break, have a drink, and then come back. You can take your drinks upstairs. Which one? The one of Peter? The one of uh, Peter is going up. Going up, you go up. We stay here. Um, we'll come back a uh, half past. Uh, uh, half past three. And I want. I. I. That's okay. Jij maakt de reportage. Ik vraag hier. Okay. Everybody in again. You worked very hard. Well, I can tell you. In this room, we really found the solution. So I'm very curious uh, what the others did. <laughs> Now, I really I appreciate and admire the way you are so much involved and are full of ideas and willing to participate. And, that, and it's really joy also to see that we are so, so nicely, and such a nice audience. Yeah, I, I look more at you than you were able to, but you hardly see that. That it's such a nice... Or a crowd with so mixed in in every in every way. Uh, um, okay, who wants to start? Sietje. Thank you, Sandra. Well, our discussion was actually I thought very interesting. It was really a fierce discussion. Uh, people with really differing views and um, people from all over the world. I also saw. Um, come in, come in. Most welcome. So um, what we actually had, I think, were two different schools. One of the schools wanted to um, yeah, just abolish the UN, and the other school wanted to reform the UN. So it was really, at first, we discussed, OK, shall we come up with something completely new, or shall we reform it? And I think in the end, we actually agreed on, well, not throwing away everything, but reforming what we have, of course, very drastically and very, uh, yeah, very intensely. Uh, our first point is actually based on an actual advice of Madeleine Albright. She advised uh, some reforms to the United Nations when it was uh, its 70th anniversary. And she came up with a UN parliament, so a UN parliamentary network, she said. And that would consist of not only nation states and representatives of the nation state, but also businesses, also NGOs and other civil society organizations. And we, I think, all agreed on uh, that was a good idea. So uh, the UN currently does not have a parliament, so not a representation of more than just the countries themselves in the Security Council. So that's the first one we came up with. Um, Peter van der Vliet also said that to make this really viable and to actually maybe make this happen, it should be pushed by states. So within the Dutch parliament, it was already an issue uh, a couple of years ago, he stated. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, this is better. Um, he said, so states should either push it for example, or also maybe civil society organizations really put their weight behind this idea. Uh, a second one, I think we also raised it within the discussions beforehand, was that accountability should definitely increase within the United Nations. The question is just, yeah, how can we achieve this? Uh, we linked it, first of all, to BitNation, which I think was a good idea, to actually give equal powers to all the states within a, um, yeah, an online network instead of just selecting some nation states with influence. Now everyone gets their say through BitNation. Not only nation states, but also organizations are welcome on BitNation. I should definitely advise you to uh, check it out. Uh, a second point was raised to make the UN more yeah, shaped like a business model. So actually to have some uh, business analyze, uh, analysts advice on restructuring the UN to make it more target focused, so KPIs, and uh, actually achieving change as an organization to really put goals for the UN. I thought that was a good one as well. Um, then we had some, yeah, I don't know, a brief ones actually. So two more points, the third and the fourth. Um, yeah, one was on actually raising issues. So for example, citizens now don't really feel maybe that they have the power to raise issues at the UN, to really set the agenda. And what uh, I think you came up with was the idea to um, yeah, make some sort of referendum or some sort of possibility of making a motion as a citizen. So for example, if you have one million or um, yeah, 
10 million you don't know people behind an issue you can raise it on the UN agenda and I thought that was really inspiring actually because yeah, yeah then you have really as we the people the opportunity to put something on the UN agenda and really have influence actually so that one is really good the last one I have to check here on the last page um, yeah it was some form of opposition because now we of course see um, nation states being represented by only yeah one representative of a country and it's mostly also within the European perspective for example focused on yeah what do the European countries think about an issue and they vote the same within the Security Council so what we came up with is forming an opposition so within countries there are of course various views on issues and yeah very different ideas on how a country should act within the Security Council so installing some form of opposition within a country consisting of experts or influential persons influential organizations might actually make it more yeah legitimate and more shared by the population as a whole so I think um, if I'm correct those were the four points we uh, we came up with okay. yeah so so if if I do understand well the abolition of the United Nations is is from the table, from the table. okay yeah. okay then I may invite Paul I thought I just had to write a summary and now I have to speak, so <laughs> uh, I'm not the best speaker, so excuse me for that. Uh, so I ask, my, 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 I ask the group if I forget something, please help me a little bit. Um, we came up with a few ideas. Um, two, two were a little bit different. I will discuss them first. First was we should attack poverty, right, if I have it correct. Yeah, we should attack poverty globally, yeah, and that will somehow change the system completely if bring the people up to speed and these local communities. That would be a more, an interesting idea. We also see that, um, yes, and then, then maybe the UN should be a bank. Yes, that was the idea actually. Okay, good. Uh, the other idea was maybe that the, the, nation, the nation as a state could be a problem actually, right? And that the nation state, well, what are we doing? They are, they, are, they are the problem. And then we came more to this conclusion that we should empower more the people. The people are the ones who should do it. We had some great experience that. How, how can we empower the people? And um, we had a few examples and then the professor gave a great idea. He said, well, there is actually an institute who can help you, who can empower the people. And let me say it correctly, this was called the ECOSOC. So he said, the ECOSOC actually exists. And this is the way how the people and the local communities and the interest group can actually influence the via the United Nations, and this should be done much more. Um, this should be done much. This should be done much more. He said, and uh, it's actually also our responsible, the responsibility of the people to do that. And maybe we are not doing that enough. Also, maybe we just let things pass or let it happen. Um, so then. As the people, you can focus on certain areas. Don't change uh, the system. We agreed on that, actually. That's not going to happen. Don't change the UN completely. But think of how to, um, if you can't change the system, maybe you can muster up enough support yeah, from local groups, from the people, from the initiative, and say, well, we want to change that. And then we come to the conclusion, which was a very interesting thing, that the politicians will follow. So the people will have to lead. So we are actually in charge. And he gave a few examples. So if we do that, and we say, well, this is a, uh, a subject we want to change something about, you feel strongly about it, you can muster support, then the pol and you take the lead via ECOSOC, uh, perhaps, or via other means, then the politicians, they love you and they want to follow. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Paul, thank thank you. you for this great summary, really. So we uh, actually, I'm very hopeful, and I found this, this is a really nice outcome. That's how much did we do in only one afternoon. We didn't know each other, not at all. And afterwards, we can say, yeah, there are starting points. So do not fight a dragon, which if you cut off his head, and then seven other heads will grow on. But just do organize yourself and be engaged. Do not 
let's think, let occasions pass by and that we later s have to say to our children, yeah, sorry, yeah, I was, uh, oh, I don't know, <laughs> I didn't know about it because it didn't I didn't follow the news or whatever. So things can be changed and it will be very difficult still. But I think uh, being here, grace to May May Meyer, that um, we will going to uh, win this uh, shape, uh, well, is it, what's the name? Of Reshape the UN Prize. So that comes, then I will come to the next question to May May and Simone. May I ask you to, to stand here? So what are next steps? What will we do with the outcomes? What do you think? Yeah, we will put them into uh, the project proposal and we will review them. Uh, we will also come up with more events, but we have to talk uh, with ourselves uh, what are our next steps going to be. I think it's very important to keep the focus on the mission, also what Peter van der Vliet uh, was saying, to focus on peace and then the model is a model and the price is a means uh, to the a means for the means. So the most important is to focus on peace, to focus on fighting poverty, and then uh, we follow an agile model. So we see uh, what event will happen uh, next. I think it's also very important to decentralize power and to involve mayors and to let to empower people. Simona also said that, and we've got good examples of what people are doing in countries to to uh, to fight for peace and we should make them more known to other people so people can learn from each other and they become their own peacemakers. Okay, so next step, Simone, thank you. <coughs> well, we hope to, to take next steps together um, and certainly we will uh, organize a few follow-up uh, meetings and we were planning a follow-up final meeting before sending in a proposal or maybe uh, partial proposals put together or whatever, huh? because we're free people. We want to make use of the wisdom of crowds, also the international wisdom of crowds. So that's why we are also producing this little clip that we will send out through the world to ask for more inputs, because we are serious with ourselves. It's not about us, it's about we the peoples. Um, and uh, I think that that's important to remember. We will find a way. I, I think we also wanted to try this together to see how the atmosphere was, whether it's enthusiasm, I think, spread the news also yourselves, try to come up, also try to uh, further focus your own thinking, so that next time we will even be better in uh, discussing maybe partial uh, uh, parts of the discussion to get more in-depth uh, in, in, into some of the, uh, the, the challenges ahead. Uh, so I think um, if you guys all leave your email addresses or whatever, maybe email is, mo is easiest, so we can, we can or, or a phone number, so we can make either a big app group or an email group or both. Um, and then we can try to spread the energy and to make the group bigger because we need all the brains to get somewhere. Yeah. And then you will inform us what will be of the course, next yeah. meeting. Then we can inform you guys on the next steps yeah. and how to bring it further. Okay, great. I would love to think, thank Joost Herman, came yeah. all the way from Groningen. Yeah. End of the work. Peter van der Vliet. Yeah. Amin uh, Ravier. Yeah. Charles Dixon. Yeah. Audi Fox Nabiore. Uh, who do I forget? Mohammed Badran, who had to go. Uh, you, all the others, Humanity House. And then uh, we will have drinks. And the moderator of today. Oh. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Um, don't leave where there are drinks, I think, and uh, we can exchange. And maybe there's some lists of uh, where we can leave our email addresses, and then we'll see each other uh, another time. Okay, thank you very much. So much. Yeah. And thanks to the technicians here and the camera. <laughs>